So, Slobodan, welcome to MOOC Plus Plus, and we are definitely looking forward to your talk because we are very interested in hearing your approach to learning and teaching C++. Uh, many thanks, Klaus. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to your group. I'm very excited to be here, and I would also like to thank uh, the uh, uh, people who are attending this talk, and I hope you will get some useful information during this talk. Okay. So I guess we can start. So a little bit of introduction about this talk. So this talk discusses some possible, and I should emphasize these possible approaches and methodologies used in learning and teaching C++. And as such, this presentation is divided into two parts. Part one discusses how to approach learning C++, and part two discusses how to approach teaching C++. I should also mention that all of these methodologies and approaches are mine and mine only, so there might be other methodologies, which is perfectly fine, so it's just something to keep in mind. Okay. A little about me. My name is Slobodan Dmitrovich. I'm a professional C++ trainer, and I'm author of a couple of books. And if you wish so, you can uh, certainly reach me at the email, my personal email, which we can discuss uh, more topics in more details. And as Klaus well pointed out, I specialize in providing introductory C++ training for teams. Okay. So how to approach learning C++? How indeed? So let's start with the basics. Let's understand what C++ is. So first and foremost, C++ is a programming language. It's a tool. A more uh, broad definition would be that it is a multi-paradigm, object-oriented systems programming, standardized ISO, ISO standardized programming language. So that's a short definition. So when we are talking about C++, what is there to learn? So when we say we want to learn C++, what exactly do we want to learn? So there are a couple of sections and, and different authors uh, divide these sections into different manners, but this is my take at it. So there is the language, the C++ language itself. And there is the C++ standard library, which is a, a collection of useful uh, functions and in-memory containers we can use. And there is then modern C++ standards. So they describe the C++ language into greater technical details. Of course, there's much, much more to this topic of C++, but when we are learning C++, these are the three main topics we should cover, in my opinion. And in this particular order. Let's look at the C++ language first. So the C++ language parts can be roughly divided into three main categories. So there are basic language facilities, and there are abstraction mechanisms such as classes and templates. So now we can see three main, uh, how should I say, categories or sections that make up the C++ language itself. Let's move on to the second topic. So it is the C++ standard library. What it is? Well, it is a library of useful containers and functions we can use in our program. Those are uh, declared in separate header files, which we include in our program. Of course, when we want to uh, compile the C++ program, we need a C++ compiler. And every compiler is accompanied by this C++ standard library. OK. And third section can be the C++ standards. So throughout the years, there were a couple of ISO C++ standards. So each standard introduces something new and might deprecate something that was uh, there in the previous uh, standard. So we can say, for example, that starting one was the C++03 or C++98, as it's also known, but 
Starting with C++11, everything from that point on is considered to be modern C++ informally. Sometimes C++20 is referred to as uh, postmodern C++. But basically, what you need to know that uh, when you want to program, you specify for which standard you want to, uh, to which standard rules you want to adhere by specifying the appropriate flag in your compiler and so on and so on. So basically, when we say we want to compile for C++11, that actually means that we actually want C++14. And if we need some features from C++17, we opt for C++17 and so on. So something to keep in mind. So now that we know what is there to learn, let's look at the available resources to us. So basically there are books, right? We all know books. There are online courses, there are online videos, and there are live trainings with C++ training. So you see that I've bolded a couple of these bullet points and I will explain why. And there are also blogs and other online resources such as Stack Overflow and uh, there are online references. But what my, in my honest opinion, you should first approach learning C++ from books. And not even one book, but a couple of books, by a couple of introductory books. Of course, do your research as anything, uh, also books vary in quality, so it's up to you to make an informed decision about which books to buy. And it is okay that as you go along and you learn from a couple of books to say, okay, I'd rather learn from these two books than from this one. So it's okay to put one aside, of course. So what's so special about live C++ sessions with trainers? Well, in my honest opinion, a trainer can shave off months of your learning experience and turn it into days. So uh, arguably you can achieve in days what would otherwise take you months to achieve on your own. Because C++ is a complex language and getting, a, I strongly recommend these two resources. Ultimately, it's up to you. Okay. So to get a feel of a resource you are learning from, let's look at the left and the right column. So let's get uh, this out of the way. C++ is definitely not C with classes. And start learning C++, you should start with this notion. It started off as C with classes, but it's now a completely different language. So prefer resources. This is just an introductory uh, example that teach you uh, the stuff that teach you things in the left column, two resources that teach you things in the right column. So let's look at the, the simple uh, Hello World problem. On the left hand side, we want to learn C++. This is an uh, id idiomatic way of displaying the Hello World in C++ followed by a new line character. On the right hand side, well, I've seen this. This is not C++. It's not C. It's some mishmash of C and C++. So prefer resources that teach you how to uh, output your data to a console using std C out to print them. Ultimately, it doesn't matter, but it is the idiomatic way to output data using the std C out object. Also prefer uh, resources that teach you how to work properly with strings in, in C++. So the proper way to work with strings in C++ is to use the std string type. There is no std string type in C, so there are options there to use either a pointer or an, a character array. Also, the final thing here is uh, how to declare the final class. So it's class my class or a struct my class. It doesn't matter. It matters in the terms of visibility, but to us, prefer resources that teach you how to define classes. So a class name in C++ is a type name, unlike in C where you have to type def the, your struct and then say this is T my class. So just something to have in mind. Also, 
if a C++ resource teaches you things like uh, malloc, C alloc, or realloc, my advice would be to find another resource because those are C related things. Okay. So how not to approach learning C++? Let me just get back to you. Okay, this is fine. How not to approach learning C++? Well, you definitely don't want to learn C++ by guessing. It is impossible to learn C++ by guessing. While some other programming languages can be learned by playing a guessing game, this one cannot. Also, try not to draw parallels between uh, C++ and other languages. That's, that's wrong for a number of reasons, because what works in one language, we might assume that it works also in C++, but it's not really the case, because C++ is in a league of its own. And also keep in mind that C++ is not C with classes, not, nor is it a subset of Java, and should not be uh, learned nor taught that way. Okay. So let's look at the uh, topics that make uh, that make up the C++ knowledge backbone. So if you remember, we uh, mentioned three parts earlier, or four together with modern C++. So these are some of the topics we can negotiate about the amount of uh, of topics you as a, a beginner should be introduced to, too. But what we should not definitely compromise uh, with is these particular topics. So you need to know them if you wish to uh, establish a solid base. Well, I will draw your attention to the right-hand side column where it says the C++ standard library. So there are many containers there, many, many containers. And the question now comes to, well, you as a beginner, which containers should you learn and which containers can you do without? So it, it is a, a complex question, but let's say you should learn about those containers that are most widely used. So that can be one guideline, what to learn, what not to learn. And when it comes to modern C++ standard features, you should also learn the most widely used and most uh, widely accepted uh, features. Not all of them, but you as a beginner should be familiar what, uh, uh, for example, let's take a C++ 11. You should know what the range-based uh, loop is, what uh, uh, what smart pointers are, what uh, lambdas are, and so on and so on. And move semantics also. So let's move on. This is really, uh, everybody gets bitten by complexity at some time. So you as a beginner, how should you address this problem of complexity? I think we should need we need to build a solid base first. So what makes a solid base? So those are the topics on the previous slide that I said. It is extremely important to notice that we, didn't, uh, we do not need to go into every detail about the language, not the library. At this point, the most important thing is to build a solid base that will enable further progress. Not knowing everything is perfectly fine, and I'll always tell my attendees this: you you don't know, you don't need to know every every uh, nitty gritty detail about the language, nor the standard library. What you but what you need to know is the those basic building blocks of the language and the standard library. Also, when you as you progress with learning C++, you can certainly also as a professional software developer uh, learn a subset of the language and the standard library that best fits your use case. Remember, often I get asked, so I can't learn every everything in this uh, standard library, nor should you. It is there for our own convenience. And just to, to 
tell you how powerful it is because there are templates and classes in C++ and in C they run those and they have to build each a container by hand every time. While in C++ standard library, we already have those built for us, so we only use them. So that's one of, of the uh, the things I like to tell people who are just starting with C++. And remember, just because the language is complex, we do not have to make it complicated just because it's complex. OK. So it, why should you learn C++? Well, first and foremost, it's an immensely powerful language. It is a language that allows you to manipulate individual bits in a byte and also enables you to soar high with abstraction mechanisms such as templates and classes. So by definition, we are covering a lot of ground with this language and that's why it is so powerful language. It is also an elegant language. It's widely used, it covers a lot of dom domains. If you like to travel, it gets you places due to the nature of, of the topics it covers and industries it covers, it potentially gets you places if you like to travel and so on. And I will give, a, give out a secret, it certainly pays well. This, your, your mileage might vary, but it certainly is about what other languages pay, some of them. So, but uh, what I like to point out is that programming in C++ is an extremely rewarding experience. What I often hear from people is they say, when I started with C++, I almost lost all interest in other languages. That is a powerful statement, but it is a statement that takes, I can relate to that because those were my sentiments uh, back in the days when I was starting and still are. And also, C++ developers are in high, high demand. So those are some of uh, things I think are very important in deciding why you should learn C++. Okay, so in this part two, we will uh, explain how to approach teaching C++ from a teacher's standpoint. Or, or uh, so you can be either a teacher on the university or a professional uh, C++ trainer, it doesn't matter. We all teach, should rather teach uh, same things. Okay, let's look at this. So as before, when we are teaching C++ to others, so what is there to teach? Let's, what uh, areas are there? So there's the C++ programming language, the standard library and modern C++ standards. And I strongly believe that at first, well, it goes without saying basics at first, but this is something that's often overlooked and people tend to jump immediately into more complex things without explaining how we got to this point. So that's, I think, it's something very important to keep in mind. Try not to overwhelm the trainee with topics in the beginning. Please remember that we are now discussing only the, uh, the starting with C++. Topics such as design patterns and too many language guidelines. So build a solid base first. Explain to them the beauty and the elegance of this language. So the, the more there is this correlation, the more elegant C++ code we write, the less assembly uh, code is generated, thus resulting in a smaller and more efficient binary. So, in that case, it is amazing, simply amazing language. Also, try to be concise, to deliver precise information, and of course, as uh, my younger students like to say, avoid fluff and too many details, and they appreciate that fact because I do my best at avoiding fluff and too many details. Okay, so this is extremely important in my view. What not to teach to a beginner in C++? You don't want to teach them how to consume OS-specific interfaces because that's a topic for some other time, uh, some other uh, course. We do not want to. Uh, we do not want to teach them how to use third-party libraries in the beginning, 
only the C++ standard library. We certainly uh, do not want to teach them design patterns when starting with C++, because that's a topic of its own. It's, it's an advanced topic. And if a resource teaches you graphics, sounds, and network with the title or how uh, starting with C++, you are well advised to find another resource. So what remember, C++ is a hardware agnostic. C++ is, is designed for an abstract hardware in mind. So we don't want to, when we're teaching C++, we don't want to uh, target any, any of these topics in particular. That's very important. We want to teach portable C++, but not domain specific use cases. OK. Let's move on. So, what makes a structured approach? Well, you, you, you as a trainer or as a teacher in C++ should uh, decide on what topics and in which order should I teach my attendees first. And in doing so, you should cover ground in a way that in thinking about how topic X relates to topic epsilon. In which order should I uh, introduce them? Because it, it makes sense to first introduce uh, types, declarations, definitions, and to talk about operators and expressions and then build in complexity because expressions ending with a uh, semicolon are statements. And if you start with a statement without prior explaining uh, what these are, so you get my point. It doesn't make much of a sense. So gradually increasing complexity, make sure that uh, you are keeping the theoretical part at the minimum, but do not compromise with the facts. We should not compromise with the, uh, let's say, we should not compromise with the terminology used and we should not compromise with the facts we need to deliver. So try to deliver the value, the actual thing that is there in the C++ language. Also, we should decide on a layout and accompany the theoretical introduction with plenty of examples. This is, I will put a virtual laser point, plenty of examples. This is something that often uh, gets overlooked. So, how should I think it should be? It should be a short theoretical introduction immediately followed by a very, very basic example. Let's call it example one. If needed, then we introduce more theory on the subject immediately followed by example two, which is uh, more complex compared to example one, but it builds, it expands on example one if possible. So start small, provide the basic example, and then provide more examples that build on each other and grow in complexity. It sounds straightforward, but often is not the case uh, when, 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 I, when I was looking at other resources. And some are doing great jobs. Some should probably, in my opinion, benefit from this approach. But then again, there's a topic that is too complex in itself, and it contains uh, m many little subtopics in its, uh, in its own. So how do you do? OK, I say like this. For example, if I'm teaching functions, so I present a definition of a function, I present a signature, and then I start with a small example. So what's the smallest example we can think of? The smallest meaningful example. Well, it should be a void function that prints hello world. And then example two says, OK, this is a void function that prints hello world plus a parameter or an argument. And then you, so then you introduce two arguments and then you introduce the new functions that uh, return the value. And you are still keeping at the uh, passing arguments about the value. And then you go to back to square one and say, OK, now I will introduce you to the new topic that is passing arguments by a reference. This also assumes that we have covered the, the topic of references 
prior to discussing these uh, parameter decorations in a function signature. And final thing is this. Keep in mind that you are teaching beginners and not other trainers. Extremely important. Okay. So, in a nutshell, small theoretical introduction, if possible, immediately followed by uh, the simplest example, immediately followed by another example that builds in com complexity and builds on the topics introduced in the example one and so on and so on. So, for example, you as a trainer will be often greeted with a number of challenges and possible some challenges, and here we will look at some of them. So, for example, in modern C++, uh, the use of raw arrays and raw pointers is largely discouraged. So, what's your decision? Do you teach those or, or not? Another topic is the std string type is, is it's not a part of the language, basic language facilities per se. It's rather a part of, of the standard library. So when do you introduce this topic? When teaching about basic language facilities or the C++ standard library? And which guidelines do you teach at the beginning? And let's look at a couple of possible solutions. This was really also challenging for me when I was, uh, when I was writing a, a book, for example. There was a lot of uh, back and forth discussion with other people who were assisting me in, in writing the book. Should they said, look, you're teaching more than C++, you should not uh, introduce uh, raw arrays and raw pointers. But I felt the need to introduce them because the, the reader is likely to encounter them in real life scenarios, for better or worse, but they are likely to encounter them. And I also introduce them, if only to discourage their use in favor of, of, of vector and array, stood array and smart pointers. But I emphasize those. I emphasize those. I tell you, look, I will introduce you to these topics that you should probably uh, not stay away from, but only to discourage their use, but you are likely to encounter them. So let's Look at example for the, uh, the std string type. The std string type is so integral to a language and everyday operation that I think you should uh, teach C++ uh, std string when teaching about the basic C++ facilities because it's so integral and also helpful when you're teaching how to pass the uh, when you jump to functions and teach how to pass things uh, by const reference and so on and so on. So the, every rule has an exception, is my point. So that's what I wanted to, uh, to tell you about. So which guidelines do you teach at the beginning? There are so many guidelines, and we can't know them all uh, by heart. So there is a software which does this for us. It says it goes through our code and says you should probably do this the other way and so on and so on. But there are a couple of most important widely used guidelines, to name a few. So pass complex types by const reference, right? Use to string, don't use uh, character arrays. Prefer smart pointers to raw pointers and possibly in later days, especially in modern C++, Try not to introduce the entire uh, std namespace into the current scope when explaining things to uh, people who are beginners in C++. And there are many more, but uh, these uh, don't introduce various undefined behaviors, but just some something to keep in mind. Okay. So that, in a way, concludes this is a brief and short discussion about some of the possible methodologies used in C++. And I would like to share with you some my, my very opinionated uh, uh, guidelines about what, what, when teaching C++, what should you take care about? So basically climbing mountain in C++ is, can be both challenging and rewarding task. But you don't even have to climb the top. You, have uh, 
you can climb half the mountain and I can assure you that the view is breathtaking. It is a language like no other. It is so amazing in its complexity and its elegance. And it is a language that can't be, uh, that can't be learned by guessing. You need to have a proper authority, uh, someone you can rely on, whether it's a book or a trainer and so on and so on. So I will quote another uh, C++ trainer who is in the, uh, in the audience now. He says, it is very hard for a beginning C++ to make a distinction between uh, people who are real authorities or a resource who is a real authority and someone who sounds like he is a real authority. So it takes an expert to spot an expert. So also something to keep in mind. And on a final note, I would like to quote Bjarne Strusuk who said C++ is not uh, rocket science, although used in one. So with that in mind, I would like to thank you and I would like to Thank Klaus for hosting this talk, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A section later on. Thanks. All right, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so are you ready to take a couple of questions that we had in the chat? Sure. All right, perfect. Then the first question is actually a very simple one, just to get started. Um, on the slide where you showed the example with Hello World, I think it was the very first slide where you showed a code, code example. You actually have sure. the um, the ending um, new line character not part of Hello World. The question in yes. the chat was why? Was there a specific reason? Yeah. On, on the yes, there is also talk on this particular subject uh, in CPP Con because when you say stood end line, when you are outputting that, what you are actually doing is outputting this little new line character plus flashing the stream, which might not be what was your intention. Okay, I get that. So the I general the consensus is to probably use uh, the new line character and not the stood end line. Okay, I think the question was why isn't the new line character just part of the C style string literal hello world? So why is it separated? Be yes, because I think it is more uh, expressive this way that uh, we are this is more expressive in a way that it's easier for you to spot a new line character as a separate uh, thing that goes into uh, after the stream insertion operator, thus uh, communicating to you what it really was. It, you, I know there is a, for example, in this often new line character goes into the, these are called string constants in C and in C++ they are called string literals. But this is, I think, is, is the preferred way. But it doesn't really matter that much, so it's up to you. It's a matter of preference, but I think this is more expressive. Okay, thank you. It's definitely fair You're enough. Um, then, unfortunately, in the chat, there wasn't a slide number, but on one slide, you mentioned that um, you should avoid teaching fluff. Um, the question in the chat was, could you give an example of what you mean with teaching fluff? Teaching fluff? Yeah, exactly. Uh, try to keep your theoretical introductions to a minimum. Meaning, any conversation, any any unrelated things should be left out. Mm -hmm. For example, can you pick a topic and I will say you how I approach those. For example, uh, look, this this goes. I've seen many resources that uh, do the following. For example, they introductory course C++. They start with a hello world, and two pages later, we are discussing uh, we are discussing classes. In my way, that's not the preferred way to go. So fluff means. Uh, unnecessary chit chat in the resource or a drink. All right. I hope this is satisfactory. Else, uh, please just ask again um, uh, if you have a follow up question. All right. No, okay. The the, uh, the, the answer is already um, great. Thank you. So this seems to be uh, a good enough answer. Perfect. Okay. Thank um, you. Then there was a couple of. 
um, discussions, started discussions. Um, however, this is then stuff that I would like to shift into our after talk chat because indeed there's a lot uh, that can be discussed, different points of views, etc. Sure. So in a second, I'll now just post the link to after talk chat. Um, please, please feel free to join us. And definitely, we, we hope to see as many of you there uh, as possible.